I suppose that um, as uh, Christian parents, we can manage just about anything that our children do, except if they abandon the church, if they abandon their faith. I mean, we'll survive as parents, we'll survive the, the crazy music, the funny hair, the clothes, the mistakes they make, the sins they commit. Foolish, crazy, reckless, selfish things they do because they're human beings and they're sinful human beings as we are. We can manage all of that. We can love them and support them through all of the ups and downs of growing up, but if they lose their faith, we feel somehow that we have failed as parents. Even if they succeed in their careers and they have good families, if they stop serving the Lord Jesus Christ, it seems that you know, all that effort was for nothing. Those late nights, that working of overtime to make enough money to provide this or that or the extra, all of that. Not worth it if they don't confess Christ anymore, if they have no use for the Lord, if they have no, no faithfulness to the church. Because Christian parents feel so strongly about the faith of their children and because there are many children who come from Christian homes but eventually leave the church and stop practicing their faith, I believe it's important to examine some of the mistakes, not that they make, some of the mistakes that we make as Christian parents. Yes, as parents, we sincerely want our children to be faithful. I've never met a Christian parent who, who didn't think that was important. That was like the top important thing that their children, we've, we all want that. But sometimes because of our misconceptions of what godly parenting ought to be, the exact opposite takes place. The opposite of what we want it takes place. In, a, in an article written by um, author um, Barry Gilraith, Power Magazine, interesting, he, he talked about the five most common misconceptions that Christian parents have about raising Christian children. I'd like to kind of jump off of that and develop his ideas here tonight. Five misconceptions. Misconception number one that godly parents have. Because I'm a Christian, my children will automatically become Christians. You know, by osmosis. My Christianity will bleed into their Christianity. I mean, just because you made this decision years ago as an individual doesn't mean that your children will also make that decision. It's not a foregone conclusion. In the Bible, the Old Testament, Samuel, prophet, servant of the Lord, holy man, serving God from an early age. But Samuel's sons did not follow after their father's ways. The Bible says they took bribes and they perverted judgment for Samuel 8.3. Samuel was a, a, a godly prophet, but apparently he did not correct the faults of his children. It didn't come automatically that they were holy men, as their father was a holy man. Children need to be taught and corrected and trained in the faith specifically if they are to believe and live according to that faith. Parents, we don't use this word, actually, we don't use this word in relationship to our children, but parents must evangelize their own children and then they must disciple their own children if they want them to be converted and then to be faithful and then to be fruitful. It just doesn't happen automatically. It's a willful thing, it's a planned thing. It's a thing that requires effort and work and time. Just because we're Christian, just because we're faithful, just because we're zealous doesn't mean that our children will be. Misconception number two. 
is the reverse of misconception number one. My actions will not influence my children's faithfulness. You cannot effectively teach children with the method that says, do what I say, but don't do what I do. Faithful parents who are involved usually produce faithful children who are involved. Why is that so? Because their body, the parents, their bodies you know, are involved in doing things to service the Lord. And they include their children in that as well. A recent survey showed that when both parents are faithfully active in the church, 90% of the time their children are also active in the church. Well, no kidding. <laughs> when both parents, only 6% of children remain faithful if parents were sporadic or not really involved or showed little interest. Well, how could it be otherwise? If we choose every time to work every shift offered to us, Sunday nights, Wednesday night, every time there's a shift, an extra shift, we grab it and we send along you know, the wife, and the kids, and then we wonder down the road, how come the kids are not interested in going to church on Wednesday night? You ought to be going to church Wednesday night. Well, where were you on Wednesday night? Where were you on Sunday night? It's an old story, but true. Children are rarely more faithful than their parents are. How could this not be? Your influence and what you do as parents, that's the key, right? I'm not telling you something that is new here. Children do what we do, not what we say. They can, they can filter all that stuff out. Misconception number three. My children will naturally show respect and give authority to those in positions of leadership. Respect for authority is taught in the home. If you're waiting, if you're waiting for your children, you younger parents here, if you're waiting for your children to go to school so that they can learn how to obey and how to respond properly to authority, it's too late. The teachers that I talk to, one of their um, most common complaint is, well, I don't mind teaching school, it's just having to raise everybody else's child that's difficult. I don't mind teaching math and grammar, it's teaching manners that's difficult and respect. Because I, I, I suppose that all of that's supposed to be being taught at home so that I can you know, get busy teaching math and geography and so on and so forth. A child who doesn't respect the authority of his mother and father will not respect the authority of Christ. Will not respect the authority of Christ's word. Will not respect the authority and leadership of those in the church. Respect and submission, the exercise of our own submission to another, those things are not automatic. Some parents you know, want the minister or the elders to get their children in line. Oh, how many calls have I had <laughs> with that intro? Yeah, well, yeah, hello, yes, oh, sister, so -so. Yeah, how are you doing? Good, yeah, sure. Uh, you want to come over to the office? Oh, you're bringing your daughter, yeah. Oh, you want me to talk to her? Really? So you've been talking to her 17 years, she hasn't listened to you, you're going to bring her to me, I'm going to talk to her, she's going to listen to me? If they have the children, if they've been rebellious with the parents and not corrected, they won't know how to submit to anybody's authority. Submitting to authority is a learned thing. We learn how to take our own will and submit it to the will of another. Hopefully parents are teaching that at an early age. Unfortunately, these type of children are usually taught about respect and authority after they get into trouble and they learn it the hard way. 
so much better to learn those things from our parents than to learn it from teachers, principals, you know, policemen. <laughs> Misconception number four, forcing my children to come to worship service or youth activities will make them rebel and hate the church. Some people think that they should just let their children decide on their own about their faith. Oh, I cringe when I hear people say this. I mean literally cringe. You know, well, when they're old enough, they'll just make up their own minds about God and things like that. Really. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition uh, to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Galatians 5, uh, 17. You see what? Paul is saying here, if left alone without guidance or training, the flesh will always, always avoid what is difficult, avoid what is godly, avoid what is spiritual. Always. Young people need to be trained in the faith and made to understand that church attendance and involvement, they're not optional things. Those are required. Some young people say, well, it's old fashioned, you know, but how else, how else can we impress on our children the importance of not only just public worship, but the importance of the church as part of our life, as, as part of our lifestyle? If the church is not important to the parents, how can it ever be important to their children? I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. Parents need to teach their kids that being unfaithful is as unacceptable as improper sex or taking drugs or quitting school, you know? If your 16 year old came home and said, you know what, I'm not into math. I don't think I'm going to take any math. I'm just not going to go to the class. Because you know, I, I want to make up my own mind about things. Yeah, how far do you think you're going to get with that one? It's just as silly to say, well, I, you know, I, I don't want to hear anything about religion. I, you can't force me to do anything. This is a free country. No. Unfortunately, in our society, the mirror that we get is that the children are in charge, the children are the smart ones, the children are going to figure out the difficult problems in our society. And how will they do that? Well, they're going to take a day off from school in March. That's not how we solve complex social issues. And children are not the spiritual leaders in the home. The parents are the leaders, the father is the leader spiritually and needs to exercise his leadership. I think the, the thing that all parents understand is that children will always challenge you. That's part of growing up. And we also understand and have learned through the years that uh, parents who deal with the challenge of their children and deal with it, not harshly or meanly, but simply deal with it uh, you know, using the things that they believe in, what is right, what is good, what is our family is going to do, gain the respect of their children. I mean, if you lose your children's respect, you've lost the game. Our children didn't like some of the arbitrary decisions that we made concerning you know, where they would go or who, who they could hang around with. You know? Lise and I just said, you know, that guy, we don't like that guy. <laughs> we don't like that friend. There's just something about that friend we don't like and we don't want you to hang around. And we would get, well, that's not fair, and you haven't interviewed them. <laughs> but that was our job, to make that decision. And invariably, later on, you know, they would come back, and you know, years later, they'd say, you know, Dad, you, know, you, you probably forgot that time, but you were right, that guy there, yeah, you nailed it, or Mom, you nailed it, yeah. Another misconception. Without a good youth minister 
and a dynamic youth group program, my children will not grow spiritually. This idea has crept into the church because in the last several decades, our society has delegated the responsibility for raising their children to other people. Daycares get them at an early age so mom can go back to work. I have no comment about that. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. That's just the reality of what's taking place. Schools have them after that. Extracurricular activities, camps, sports, organizations keep them busy after school, on weekends, TV, the internet watches them the rest of the time. So when it comes to faith building, it's easy to think that we can hand this job over like we've done everything else to someone else. That's my point. You know, personally, I became a Christian when I was 30 years old. I had never attended Bible school, never in my life. Didn't even know what it was. I'd never been taught by a, quote, youth minister. I'd never been part of a youth group, never been to a camp, to a rally, nothing. Devo, didn't even know what that was. But somebody shared the gospel with me and I obeyed it. And 41 years later, here I am. What children need is to hear the gospel and see the gospel being lived and encouraged to obey the gospel themselves. Paul tells us the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Not camps, you know, these things are tools. Now don't get me wrong, there are important, these are important uh, uh, ways to help young people live out their faith. And here in Choctaw we've benefited by having uh, Mike and Jessica work it with our youth uh, a program. It's expanded it, it's, it's given activities to the young people, it's developed them spiritually. Many baptisms have occurred, absolutely. But coming to faith happens when you hear the word of God, irregardless of who preaches it to you. Youth ministers and workers, youth programs are meant to reinforce what parents have instilled in their children, not replace the parents. And I know many youth ministers, uh, that's usually their number one, not complaint, but observation about their jobs. That they want to be able to reinforce and support and encourage the things that the parents are teaching their children, they want to be able to reinforce that in, with various activities. But they don't want to replace the parents now, Brother Galbraith, he mentioned five, I add a sixth. I've got to contribute something to this sermon. <laughs> Here's misconception number six about godly parenting. Parents deserve all the credit or all the blame for the success or failure of their children. I know that much of this lesson has stressed the importance of the parental involvement in the spiritual lives of their children. However, we must remember that each child has free will and in the end is responsible for their decisions and their actions regarding their faith. I used to say to our children when they were still home growing up, you and I are connected with a rope. That rope is called responsibility. And right now you're young, 12, you know, 13. The, the, the length of rope between me and you is about that long. And I hold that rope tightly. But as you grow older, I'm going to give you more rope. Because the goal for me as a parent is to eventually let go the rope. So the faster you take the rope, quote, responsibility, the more rope I give you. The less responsibility that you take, the more rope I take back. <laughs> because in the end, I would say to them, this is your life, not mine. Your life. You're going to get to decide. You're going to vote. And there's only one vote that will count, and that will be your vote. I'm only here a little while so that you don't spin completely out of control while you are mature, while you are young, while you are learning how to live.
Parents need to avoid the two extremes in raising faithful children. On one side, some parents, they think that they, they take all the credit for faithful sons and daughters. They are under the impression that through their efforts at discipline and Christian example, their children have no option but to turn out okay. Of course, this attitude is based on pride and it leads to self-righteousness. These kind of parents use their children and their parenting skills as the standard that everybody else should use. After all, they've succeeded and they've proven that they, you know, they're right and their methods have worked. They usually uh, 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 become critical and intolerant of other parents' weaknesses and failures, thinking, you know, if, if those parents would just, just do it like I do it, you know, they'd have the same success as me. Now people who think this way are missing a few important facts. For example, all the correct teaching and example will not influence a child who refuses to respond. Have you ever had a kid that says no? <laughs> Do not smoke cigarettes. Bad, wrong. Your dad tried it for 20 years, no good. You know, all the teaching in the world about uh, you know, the evil of tobacco. And what do they do? Just want to try it. I picked that, it's an easy one. They say no to you. In the Bible, David taught Solomon and gave the example. But Solomon became unfaithful anyways. Parents who succeed owe their success to many people, not just themselves. Certainly they owe it to the Lord. They owe it to their children who decide to respond. They owe it to family, to teachers, ministers, coaches, mentors, people who have helped along the way. Their self-righteousness in thinking that it's all on them, that they've succeeded all by themselves is sinful and they may also be modeling this attitude for their children to carry on for another generation. And this is an awful burden for children to carry around. My parents work 100% successful and if I'm not successful, well, boy, you know, I'm a failure. Parents who take all the credit for their children's faith set themselves up for a terrible disappointment if ever their children do not line up to their standards. Self-righteous parents tend to either be unforgiving when their children fail or when others fail or they swing over to the other extreme. They take all the blame. Think about it now. And if you're totally responsible for all the success, well then you should be totally responsible for all the failure too. You can't have one without the other. As I said, two extremes. The other extreme is some parents take all the blame. I've seen so many parents with extreme feelings of guilt because their children are unfaithful or unsuccessful in life. They think it's their fault. Now sometimes there's reason for guilt. You know, dad was too busy, mom was an alcoholic, parents were unfaithful to the church for many years, yeah, a lot of reasons. Again, we need to remember that regardless of our ability to be ideal parents, the final decision rests with the child. Jesus says that those who seek will find, Matthew 7, 7. Ezekiel says that the children will not be punished for the sins of the fathers and the fathers will not be punished for the sins of the children. Ezekiel 18, 10 to 18. What this means is that God recognizes that both parents and children will sin, will fail in many ways, and each will be judged on their own. That parents did a poor job in bringing their children to the faith will not be a valid excuse for children to use at their own judgment. You know, the judgment's on us. I have to bear my judgment for my decisions and our children will have to do the same. Taking all the blame is as bad as taking all the credit because it comes from the very same place, it comes from pride. 
These parents would take all the credit if they could, but because their children's failure is evident, they take all the blame instead. And of course, this type of attitude leads to cynicism and neg uh, negativism and a, a loss of personal faith. Parents who take all the blame lose heart because they think, what's the use of trying? You do your best and you still fail. And already parenting, let's face it, is the most guilt-producing activity that an individual can be involved in. <laughs> you don't have to do it on purpose to put guilt on yourself. It's already built into the activity. Taking all the blame also misses several important points. First of all, the child has a role to play and part of the blame belongs to him or to her. You can bring a horse to water, right? But you can't make a drink. Parents who fail have usually fought against bad influences at school or sickness or problems in the family, the many traps set by Satan to ensnare a child. You know, as much as you want to be with a child and teach and mentor and so on and so forth, if you're a full-time caretaker of your mother who's got cancer, yeah, that's going to cut into your parenting time. If your husband's an alcoholic, yeah, that might be difficult to kind of maintain family faithfulness and let's have a devo, you know, yeah. <laughs> you might have a little trouble. If the child himself has a serious illness, how about, how about, how about a child who suffers from chronic depression? So let's not be too fast you know, to take all the blame. It's a sinful world, it's a fallen world. It's not a cop out, but some parents have less to work with and greater obstacles to overcome than other people. And of course, we need to remember, it's not over until it's over. Many who take all the blame usually are too quick to throw in the towel. Maybe they're tired, maybe they're lazy, maybe they're fed up of trying, so it's easier to take all the blame and then just give up on the faith that their children should have. Parents with unfaithful children should never give up praying, never give up hope, never give up trying to influence their children for Christ. How many parents have I told that particular thing to? I don't know what to do. Pray. And they go, oh yeah, pray. As if that's like nothing. As a Christian, we have access to the throne of God in prayer. I think that the majority of our time, the majority of our effort on behalf of our children as life moves on is through prayer. We only have them with us a few years, right? Just a few years and it goes by very quickly. After that, they're on their own, they're doing their thing, they're independent of us, making all their own decisions. But we can still pray to the very end to the very, very, very end, we should continue to pray. There would be a lot less jealousy and strife in the church if each parent used the Bible as the standard for good parenting and Christ as the point of comparison for their children. Instead of comparing their parenting skills and their children to other parents in the congregation, that, that's a recipe for disaster right there. When we measure ourselves against God's word, when we judge ourselves and our children's faith and actions against Jesus the Christ, there'll be no room for boasting. There'll be no delusions that we are responsible for everything because we're not. And so regardless of our you know, parenting abilities or the relative success of our children in school or in their Christian walk, we all want the same thing, don't we? 
We want all of our children to go to heaven. That's what we want. Your children, my children, your grandchildren and my grandchildren. We want them to go to heaven. Each parent should want that for every child, not just your own child. Hell is too terrible a place to be for us to feel smug and self-confident because we see someone else's child failing in faith and for some reason or other that makes our kid look good. You know, my heart breaks for your child if your child is a rebel and is, 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 is going away from Christ. And our own children are only one decision away from, from leaving the faith. We should mourn for every child who struggles, every child trapped in disbelief, because it could easily be our child in that situation. We should support and encourage one another as parents, because we cannot control the outcome of our children's passage through adolescence and adulthood. We can affect it, but we can't control it. In the end, every faithful child is the product of the effort of many people. Instead of being self-righteous, we should rather be thankful. And every child who fails is the product of the weakness of many people. Instead of continually feeling guilty, repent. Let's ask God to forgive us so that we can have a positive and hopeful attitude. Who knows? Who knows? When our children see us repenting and making changes, it gives them an image of what to do in their own lives, with their own sins. So if you need to repent because you recognize that you've been at one extreme or the other, I would encourage you to do that. You know, if you're wondering, where do I start as a parent? Recognize and acknowledge the things that you actually have done and repent of those and ask God to forgive you and begin an active, aggressive prayer life on behalf of your children, whether they're 14 or 44 or 64. God will hear those prayers on their behalf. Now, if you're not a godly parent because you've not given your own life to God through faith in Christ, expressed in repentance and baptism, well, of course, at each opportunity, when anyone is in this pulpit to preach or to teach, we extend the opportunity for those to come and confess Christ and to be immersed. If that's something that you uh, may need at this time, then we do encourage you to do that as well, as um, uh, Brother Harold will lead us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing that song, please? 